Entonces, cuando queráis, empezamos. Ok, so whenever you like, we can get started. First of all, thank you for coming. I know that it's a, you know, difficult morning for to get people to come, you know, after Saturday night, but we'll start with the presentation. We have, a, uh, first of all, a summary of who I am. This is basically, well, I'm a person with a lot of curiosity, interest in things. I've worked in, I ended up working in IT, pen testing, forensics. And this is something uh, here, a picture to remind me of friends who haven't come. Uh, I think they imagined had a complicated night last night, Saturday night, so they're not here, so that's just to remind me of them. But basically, if you're working in IT, security, pen testing, why are you going to do a presentation about big data? or machine learning? Well, basically, because I was, when, before I started at university, I thought about doing psychology because I was interested in psychology. I was interested in the idea of, you know, of how we learn. So, uh, a couple of years ago, I said, why don't I come back to that, that I like, these learning techniques that took me to big data uh, and that brought me to machine learning. And since I want this presentation to be a little bit dynamic, I want everybody to be involved. Well, on Friday, in one of the speeches, when they asked people, they asked you, they had sweets, and they gave you a sweet if you asked a question. And when I ask you a question, I'm going to, well, I thought of those sweets, and I've brought a bag. I've got a bag. So the, it's all I could find, there's some snacks, it's all I could find this morning on my way, but you know, I brought them along so to try and get you to participate. And can anybody say, first of all then, what is big data? Because we hear about it all the time, but can anybody define what big data is? I mean, I've got this bag, you can get a reward. Okay, well, it's a trick question because I wanted to keep this bag for me and I've managed to keep it for me. So what is big data? Well, big data is, well, we can define it. We're listening to this phrase the whole time and we can define it as a platform, a whole set of algorithms which are going to allow us to process large amounts of information in a fast and efficient way. And when it comes down to it, well, how can this uh, affect me in my day-to-day -day life? Well, CyberCamp is here to make us more aware of the dangers that exist in browsing, how to use mobiles and all that kind of thing. So, so they might think, well, what's big data got to do with security? Well, when it comes down to it, can you think of any danger represented by big data for our privacy, for our security? Well, when it, if we really think about it, it does represent a uh, danger because big data is being used by lots of companies, by lots of governments, by intelligence services, and they are using our personal information, uh, sensitive information. They take the information from our, of our searches, the information that we share in social networks. They're using the information that we publish on personal websites that we have, what we share using WhatsApp. So the messaging services and all of that kind of information that we're using represents a risk. Why? Well, I could give you some examples. Imagine if you go to a job interview and you are people, you're perfectly appropriate to take that job, but the HR people in that company have been able to buy information, for example, about your internet searches or the information that you've shared via Twitter. You've had that exposure and they might say, hey, mm, that person is maybe a little bit troublesome for this company we, and they won't hire you. Or they may want, or you might want to have an insurance policy, but the company, the insurance company, has had access to certain searches that you have done on internet. For example, for when you felt pain, knee pain, for example, and that insurance company, thanks to the fact that they have that information, your browsing record, and they may change the policy they offer you or deny you a health insurance policy, for example, or a so these are risks 
that we run when we use Internet. Perhaps not a risk of malware, but the risk of third parties using information if it's being bought and sold by third parties. And here I'm going to talk about technical things. I'm going to talk about spam, about machine learning. But if you want to really keep one idea from this presentation, it's the idea that you have to be very careful with your privacy on Internet. So not just you, but the people that you have around you. They should uh, also understand that. Try and make them understand that you have to <clears throat> send the smallest amount possible of personal sensitive information via internet because it could lead to you losing jobs, paying more for products, and this is something which is dangerous. So, before we lose this, we'll get started with this presentation after that brief introduction in order to make you slightly more aware. So, what am I going to talk about during this talk? I'm going to divide it into two parts. The first one is going to be about what Spark is. I'm going to talk about the data structure it uses, the operations or transactions that can be done using Spark. And why am I going to talk about Spark? Well, because Spark is the big data platform that we are going to use for the second part of the talk. And what's the second part of the chart going to talk going to be about? Well, that's the bit that's related to the title I gave to this talk. Why do we need Batman if we've got big data and machine learning? So in the second part of the talk, what we're going to see is a concept test of how to train a program to predict predict crimes using statistics from the Chicago uh, region and we're going to use that on the Spark platform. And in this talk we're going to cover these subjects and we'll get started. What is Spark then? So I imagine if I ask what is Spark, I'm going to end up keeping the snacks to myself. Anybody dare to suggest, has any programmer or anybody who's listened or heard something about Spark? You've not, if you've not heard anything about big data, then I can imagine I'm going to keep all of these snacks for me. Okay, the first one for you. You've, you've won it. Yeah. I'm sorry we can't hear the, uh, the person that's speaking. They're not using a microphone. That's it, exactly. If you didn't hear what she was saying, Spark, we can define it as a, purpose, a general purpose service, and one of the main characteristics is its speed, as she said quite rightly, and it will allow us to execute or carry out a job in a dispersed way over the nodes of a cluster. So uh, we could call it a platform uh, in which we will be able to um, have an algorithm and it, we have the work that we divide up into tasks, this job divided into tasks, and we distribute the tasks amongst lots of workers, and those workers will work in parallel and provide the solution for me. It's uh, the idea of carrying out things much more quickly. So it's a general purpose, and it has different modules, different tasks. And we've got Spark SQL with relation data information we have from SQL. Then we have Graph X, which allows us to process graph information. And then we have a third module, which is Spark Streaming, which allows us to work with data flows. That's very useful if we want to have Twitter use Twitter information, for example. If we want to analyze, analyze the NSA, how it uses metadata, information from Twitter, the information that we're transmitting, we're sending out, then that comes in that module. And it has a fourth module, which is what we're going to talk about in this talk, and we're going to use, which is Spark MLDF. And it allows us to use machine learning libraries, so artificial intelligence. Here in this, we can see that it's written in uh, a Scala. It's using Scala. It's written in Scala. I'm not going to ask if anybody knows anything about that. Ah, well, there you go. Scala, if you want to know, is a programming language which brings together the paradigm of functional programming with a paradigm and um, target-oriented programming. And the problem is that, well, Scala, hardly anybody knows about Scala. And if you want to have a look at it, there's a course on Coursera 
Coursera uh, offers internet courses and Marco Nodeste provides a very good course. He is behind Scala. He, he you know, created Scala and he provides a course. And since when Spark was developed in order to attract developers, they provided APIs in order to be able to use other programming languages, for example, APIs for Java, for Python. There are quite a lot of developers there. And from the version 1.4 of Spark, they also added a packet for working in R, which is another programming language which is used in data science when we are uh, working with statistics, science, and such like. And they added that alternative. And I think we've got uh, 1.5.2 is the latest version that they've got right now, if I'm not wrong. So if you want to work with Spark, we have shells. We have these interpret commands, and those shells can be used for the Scala version, which we're going to have for the proof of concept, and also for Python, and the version 1.4 as well. We have a shell for R. And before going on with this, uh, with the RDDs, I'm going to explain this uh, chart or this graph that we have here, the, the picture that we can see on the screen. And this is the way that Spark works, so we can get an idea of what it's all about, what this tool is. So initially, we have a program, a Spark application. And on the one hand, it's going to need a process, which is called a driver. And it's also going to need a whole set of processes, which are called executors. And the driver, we can see that as um, something which is going to be in charge of executing the program's workflow. And once we have the flow for that big program, we're going to divide it up into little tasks, as I said before, and those tasks are distributed amongst the executor program so that they can carry that. And this was the idea of divide and rule that I mentioned earlier. And here we have then, we can see the driver program, the ones that program, we'll be able to see that as the main function of the program, that's the driver, it's the main function. And that main function, what it's going to do is it's going to create an object which is called the Spark context. And why does it create the Spark context? Well, because that's what's going to tell Spark how it has to access the cluster that we're going to be working with. And, well, once we've created the Spark context, the driver program, what it's going to do is communicate with the driver manager or what we call the master node. So in that so-called master node, what we're going to have is a service which is called Spark Master. This Spark Master, there's one for each cluster, and what it does, it manages the applications. So this is what's really going to manage the applications. And when it manages them, it's going to distribute the tasks into which the job has been divided up into, and it's going to give them to the workers, the Spark workers, so that they can execute those tasks. And then we would come to this part, the worker nodes or the slave nodes. And we're going to have another thing here, which is the another node, which is the Spark worker, which is there to start up and monitor the executors, the executor programs. And each executor, what it's going to have is a kind of set of slots or of cells where it's going to be able to execute the tasks that it receives. So here we have the driver, which communicates with the master, the master node, and the Spark master distributes the whole program, it divides it up into smaller tasks, so these can be executed by the workers. So more or less we've seen the half which is on the left hand side, and if we look at the right hand side, we can see that we have more pictures. So I've explained what the distribution of the instructions of the program would be, but those instructions work with data, and this is what we have on the right hand side of this picture. So the, these are stored in files which are called HDFS, the Hard Distributed File System. This is a system for files written in, in Java and it's based, just if you're interested, it's based, based on GFS in Google and that allows us to store a large amount of information in a fault tolerant way so it replicates the information. And HDFS, how does it work? Well, it has what we call a name node and a whole set of data nodes. What does the name node has have? Well, we can see one here on the right. The name node, what it stores are metadata from the files that we're going to be working with. So information from the data. I don't know if any of you have a pen and I can draw, but I'm going to tell you a little bit. But the name node, imagine 
we have two files, file one, file two. And file one, what we're going to do is to divide it into different parts. We're going to divide them into blocks, and so you know the smallest size for the block. In the past, it was 64 megs, and now it's 128 megs, so that means that we're going to be working with very big files, and we're going to divide them into blocks, where the minimum size will be 128 megs. Okay, thank you. I'm going to make a graphic here. Here I'm going to paint with the name node DOS and what it stores. Okay, so imagine we have file one point log, one dot, dot log. And we say that it's a split between block one, two, and three. So each block has at least 128 megas. Each block. And then we have another file called file2.log split in blocks 2 and 5. This is what the name node contains. It contains this relationship and the good thing with HDFS is that it will allow us to keep the information in a replicated way. So we will say that block 1 will be in which data nodes? It will be, for example, on data node 1, data node 1, data node 3, for example, and data node 5. So by default, each block is stored at least in th on three data nodes. So eventually what we have is a map that will state in which blocks is every file split and where the blo those blocks are. So we get information on very large files in a replicated way and I know how to access it. And this is the way, t the way Spark works. On the one hand, the instructions are split in tasks, and on the other hand, the files are split in blocks. That's the way it works. So, which is one of the main features of Spark? Is the one there on the last line, the resilient distributed data set. And what is that? Eventually, these are things that we've never heard of, but we go to the next slide, and the RDD are the resilient distributed data sets. The resilient side may be seen and if we lose that memory information, we can always rebuild it. That's the resilient bit. For distributed, the data will be distributed in the class of nodes. And regarding the data set, the files may be obtained either from external sources or they may be created programmatically through development of programming instructions. But after the abbreviation is explained, how can we define RDD? Well, it's a tolerant collection of fail to failure of elements with which we can operate in parallel. Again, divide and rule. And we have two ways of creating RDDs. First, by parallelizing an existing collection on the driver, on the name function of the program, let's say you have a ride and you have a, an array a set of elements on the driver, so we have everything on the same planes, but we're paralleling it, we're distributing it in different nodes in parallel. So from a structure, we distribute it in different nodes, and we parallel that collection. Secondly, we create the RDD from a file that is in an external storage source that we'll see later. Just so that it will sound familiar after this talk, let me tell you about some concepts. For example, how could we parallel a uh, collection? And I'll give you an example regarding the SEL then, so that we can start playing a little bit with this. Let's see whether we can have access to this. Well, the SEL part just got frozen. It's due to the screen resolution, actually. Oh, I can't even minimize. Well, I'll just show it here. And while I show you the concept demo, I'll need to restart the computer. Because in HDMI, sometimes the taskbar freezes and I can't even access the, access the SEL. Okay, I'll just show it over here, so you may remember. Just imagine we have a collection on our driver. 
that we can call data. And this is an array of four elements, one, two, three, and four. And we have this in the driver in the same place. So can we, how can we parallel this? Well, through by an instruction called parallelize. Um, method called Spark Context that creates the driver. So with the SCL of a Spark, we can create a Spark Context object called SC. So by calling SC dot parallelize and transferring our collection with this we have created my RDD. With this we will already have an RDD, something that we will start to work with and that we will work on the POC part. So with this instruction with parallelize for the method of this park concept I can have an RDD. So something very important with parallelize is a second optional parameter it has because here we saw a parameter called data from the renal connection. But as developers we may want to decide on how many parts we're going to split that RDD to distribute it on the data nodes. And that's a second optional parameter it has. And that second optional parameter it will allow us to say how many. So Spark will execute a task per each slice or division we do on the RDD. One task per slice. So usually you might say, well, how many slides will we split our RDDs into? Well, usually it is advised to do between two and three slides per each CPU in our cluster from two to four slides and after telling you about this boring information we can just forget about it because the Spark does it automatically it checks our classes features the nodes and the CPUs of each node and it calculates the optimum number of slides to split our data set that will work with our RDDs and distribute them. So this is for creating an RDD from an, an already existing collection on the driver. Next, we'll create an RDD, which is what we will do in our POC from an external source. And which external sources can we use? Well, any that supports Hadoop. It could be our own local file system, our HDFS, as we saw on the chart. It can be HBase, Cassandra, Amazon S3. And if we're interested, we can even load a text file or a CSV file where we have our information. And on the practical side, we're going to create a system that may predict crimes. But that system needs to get in incoming information. So let's say we have different sensors. Those would be our information sources. So we would need to load the information of those sensors and take it to Spark. So how can we do that? By a method called text file. The method is called text file. De también del objeto Spark Context, ¿vale? Antes hemos visto. For the Spark Context object, the other one of the methods was parallelized, and the other one we'll use to load the RDDs is this one here, text file. So, as a parameter, they get the path of the file that we're going to load. And from this path, what the file is, we're going to create that RDD, that distributed data collection. And just like before, we have the option of, of citing how many chunks we want to split that file we're going to load. How? Through a second optional parameter that we may have here. And here, so that you can have a little more information, just in case you want to work with this at some point, I need to say that Spark will create a slice on our files per each data block we have. So before we saw that on HDFS, which is the file system we're going to use, the size of the block is 128 megas. 
So, for each block our file has, they are going to create a slice. Well, I may say, well, I want to have more slides. But we need the same number of slides as blocks because a block is a minimal unit that we can split files in. And this is regarding how we create RDDs. And now this is again another bore. I think you're going to earn all the candy and all the snacks I've bought. So we've seen what is Parkit, so we've seen its main data structure, the RDDs, and next we're going to see some operations we can carry out with it. And that leads to this slide. So on this part we have two types of operations we can work with, the transformations and the actions. First, let's look at the transformations. What's a transformation? Well, a transformation is an operation, and look at the chart, that will allow me to create a new RDD from an existing RDD. But the output is a new RDD, a new data animal with a lot of information. And on the first dot it says lazy assessment, because transformations have something called lazy transformation. And if you are work, if you are developers, if you are developers, it may sound familiar, this term, lazy assessment. And this is slightly different from what we have regarding how to apply operators in lazy assessment and programming languages. Lazy assessment refers mainly to the fact that when we execute an instruction for a transformation, we're not going to calculate that transformation at that point whenever the instruction is executed. What we'll do, what Spark does, is to keep that instruction. And you may say, well, when will they execute that instruction? Well, when will it become effective and calculate a new RDD? Whenever it applies an action on that transformation. The other type of options I haven't explained, well, it will be done there. We say, oh, what is the use of this? What is all this about? But the purpose of this is that this policy and the fact that when I have a transformation and execute the, tra the transformation executions, it doesn't calculate the RDD at that point because you allow for a more efficient execution of Spark. Let's imagine we execute the uh, a transformation and that I will render an RDD that we need to sort in the memory. These are resources and let's say I then apply the transformation to the first one. I get a new RDD with more information to be loaded on the memory. And let's say I apply another one. I get even more. And eventually, when they develop Spark, all these transformations that I can carry out through time become effective only when I'm interested in those. And that would be when they do the other operations, the actions. And eventually, the set of transformations that I have will be executed at a certain point in time, not throughout a whole period. I don't need to keep a whole data structure in memory for a long time. I'll just make them effective whenever I'm interested in it, to save resources and for the memory to be quicker. And you'll see that in my example. And the last line here has some transformation examples so that after this talk you can know what a map is, just in case you want to talk about it on a weekend conversation or as a chat up line. Well, Maybe forget about it. Although, you know, you never know, some people might be interested on maps as chat lines. But a map is a transformation that receives a function as a parameter and is applied on an initial RDD. And it applies that function on each element of the initial RDD, and the result will be given back or delivered in a new RDD. We'll see some examples next, and then we have another one here, which is filter, that also gets a function as a parameter, and it applies to uh, an entry or starting RDD. And what it does is applying that function in each element of the initial RDD, and it generates a new RDD with those elements of the initial RDD for which the function is true. 
this may sound a bit confusing, but let's look at a slide that explains this further. Right here. So above, we can see an original RDD and an input RDD with lines. Each line has several sentences. And this will be an RDD from a text file. So if you go down in yellow and purple, you see that on the left, you see the map operation for Python. And in purple, you see the map operation with this color syntax. But what does it do? Well, they take each line of the initial RDD and apply a function. And in this case, they get each line and they put it in capitals. They capitalize them. So on the left, we're defining a lambda function that we don't give a name to, but we rather define the body of the function directly. And that's a bit quicker. And with these quick things, we do not need to define everything, we just do it directly there. And here we're applying a transformation that will make each line do have the text in capitals. So we get to the second RDD, which is the same one as above, but with everything written in capitals. Please remember that when that map is executed, the first one, we do not obtain the second RDD. What is stored on the Spark is the map, the instruction, until we get an action and we haven't seen them, seen them yet and it applies on that transformation on that map, we will not have that second RDD to optimize resources. And next, we have a filter transformation example that we'll see here. On that intermediate RDD, we'll apply a filter on which we'll apply for each line a function. And what we'll do is keep those lines that start with an I. And we keep the rows with I for second RDD. So this is a transformation. Is it clear now what the transformation is? Okay, so we have seen the transformation. Let's go see the actions next. Okay. So, here are the actions, which is the second type of operations we can do with Spark. And what is an action? An action is an operation that will be executed on an input RDD. It will create some calculations on the elements of that input RDD, and it will render a value that will be received by the program's driver. What do we get with this? that what the driver's program will receive is more efficient. Instead of receiving a massive amount of information, it just gets a value so that we're not overloading the resources. So please remember this. The transformations give a new RDD and the actions give a new value. value. And the actions will apply the previous transformations. We need to remember all that. And here are a few examples. Well, we have count, that gives me the number of elements of an RDD, and we have take, n, that gives me an, ar an array with the n first elements of a set, and we have collect, that gives me an array of all the elements of the RDD, in case I want to access them, and that information is the one the driver gets for the main function of the main program. And there's another important one here, Someone talk about map review algorithms or map reduce algorithms. So the reduce transformation, the reduce action rather, also gets a function and it's applied on an input RDD. And it will aggregate all the elements of that input RDD using this function that is here. And this function has this format. You will get two values, two items from the initial RDD and you will do an operation here and will give back one, one result. It will do an operation here and you will render a result. To explain this, I'll give you an example. I was going to do it on the SEL, but since it was a bit frozen, I may need to reset it after the presentation is over. But I'll just show, show it to you here. So let's say we have a text file here where we have a line with one, two, three, four, five, six, 
Here we have another line with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 numbers. So let's imagine that from this text file that we can call file.txe we get requested to create an RD and to count the length of all the lines of the file. How can we do this by combining the transformations and the actions? Eventually, the total number of lengths of the lines need to be returned. So since this one has 10 and this one has 6, the result will be 16. So how can I do that with all these things I've been telling you about? Well, first of all, we will create the RDD as we've seen on the sfc.txt file. SC text file. I'm saying is slash home slash user slash txt file. And this is the RDD, file RDD, we create the RDD with this, we have created it, we have uploaded this file from an external source and we create an RDD and next we want to calculate the length of each line and we can do that with a map. How? Well, I can create an RDD, there will be long lines. So we would call the RDD we created and we would call it RDD.map and we would say that for each line we have L.length. Length. So here I'll create an RDD where each input is the length of a line. So I'm creating something, creating something that would appear here, 6 and 10. And this is what we did here. And last, since I'm being requested to sum up all the lengths of this RDD, I will apply a reduce. We will say, okay, val, result, long lines, dot reduce and next I actually tell you that this function gets two elements a semicolon b and we add them up so what do we do here we get this element and this element and we sum them up and we add them up so let's say here we had a one and two be 3. So here would be 6 and 10. 16. And we'll go to the next one. Here we have got 16 and here we got a 3. And eventually we will get the result 19. And this is the way the operations of MapReduce work. This is worth it if you end up working with machine learning. And now this is a big bore. But at least you know the basic things. Map reduce, how to create RDDs, so that you get to know these concepts by the time you leave. So before we start with machine learning, let me tell you, uh, tell you about an important feature of Spark. And after this, we'll start doing practical things. But another important feature of this is persistence. Let's say we created some sort of an RDD, such as this one, and we know we're going to use it on several points in time. So maybe we want those RDD elements to remain in the node's memory because, because each transformed RDD that we execute every time we execute an action on them needs to be recalculated. We cannot just keep them in the memory. We need to recalculate them. So if we know that we're going to use an RDD a few times, maybe you may be interested in storing it in the memory of the cluster nodes. And this is what Spark allows. It allows us to do this. And this is different from other approaches such as MapReduce. Eventually you have an instruction that will allow us to do this. And that instruction is called persist. And this method will allow us to get an RDD and keep it in the cluster memory nodes so that whenever it executes future actions on it, the access 
to the access elements will be much quicker. So in this little program, I know the long lines will be used afterwards. And before I execute the action, I could have said, well, long lines not persist. In this way, long lines will be in the memory of the cluster nodes. It will be cached. And then I could use it afterwards. So this first time, this RDD for long lines is calculated, and this will be when this reduce is applied. And this is right when this RDD will be loaded on the node's memory. I wanted to clarify that when we work with machine learning and we have this instruction, the RDD is not being loaded on memory. What is being loaded is a pointer or a link to the RDD to save a space. And when we do this instruction in this map, we're not actually doing the transformation, as I was saying. What Spark does is just to keep the instruction. It just to do a map, and for each line it needs to calculate the length. And when we get to this one, to the reduce, the action, this is when we do all the former steps and apply the former instruction. instructions. Is this clear? And eventually it's a bit more efficient and speedy. And the having more persistent network means that at Spark they think that when you do it, you manage to make your actions ten times quicker by doing this. So after this big bore, I'm going to give you another bore. Come on, guys, you you're earning all those snacks. And I've already told you about the platform we're going to work with. Next, I'm going to tell you about the other part, the part of machine learning. I don't know whether you tried to work a little bit with machine learning, I guess so. You're going to get the whole bag of snacks. Would you like to define machine learning for me? We apologize, no microphone is being used. A bit more complex. No, si esto hay muchas formas de definirlo al final. Many ways of defining it. Estás terminando y ahora el micrófono. Fenomenal. Just got your microphone. And you need to repeat the whole thing. You're really brave. Another bag. No pasa nada, ya lo cuento yo, ¿vale? Sí, de verdad, yo te lo agradezco. De verdad, ahí está la parte final. Thank you very much for your participation. So what is machine learning? Well, machine learning is a set of algorithms whose main purpose is to do predictions and make decisions using example data to do so. So eventually, so that you know about machine learning concepts, we have different types of learning, such as supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforced learning. One thing that should be clear is that all these algorithms eventually need to define for each element to be studied a set of features. So let's go deeper here. Let's imagine our concept test based on predicting crimes. And they say, well, you need to develop a program to prevent crimes. So I may need to define the characteristics of those crimes. And I call them attributes. Let's say the characteristics of a crime it could be the type of crime, whether it's a theft or a drugs or narcotics crime or the latitude and longitude or it happened or the date or the atmospheric conditions or the district they may say well from all these characteristics you need to be one in the case of my concept test I may need to predict the type of crime and to that feature or characteristic of the study I'm studying that I need to predict the value of we call it 
label. So I need to see which other characteristics and attributes do have an influence in the value and result of that label. It's like the cause and the consequence, and the cause and the effect. The effect will be the values of the label I want to predict, which is the label, and then I need to find predictive characteristics of that label. In the case of criminal matters, in the case of predicting crime, we need to do a prior study. We may need to call a criminal expert, a psychiatrist, a sociologist, so that they investigate the causes that provoke a certain type of crime. So as a, a computer scientist that can model it. And we always need some sort of external advisor to do research on this. So if we imagine another example which could be a creating a system which would be able to predict values of a business's uh, share value, for example, we could think of certain characteristics or attributes that could have an impact on the value of the company's shares, Here, one which is bound to work, which would be the ability of that company to bribe, for example. If a company has a large lobbying power, you could say, then their share values are going to be very high. I can tell you that already. So we could be talking about a predictive figure. So the label in that example would be the price of the shares, and the attributes would be, for example, the sector in which the company works, the date, for example, because sometimes the date has an impact. It could be, for example, their ability to uh, work as a lobby, which sometimes is related to their ability to bribe. And so if you get an idea, then we're talking about predictive variables that have an impact on what I'm trying to predict. We call them features or characteristics, and what I want to predict is the label. And many machine learning algorithms work with numerical values. So when it comes down to it, this is going to, uh, well, when I receive information, text information, I have to transform that text. The value of the features, I have to turn it into a numerical figure, and that's why we have different mm, mechanisms, different methods, and some might sound familiar, bag of words, one of K encoding, and so there are methods to turn text into numerical values, which is what the machine learning algorithms are going to require, because when it comes to it, we get to a features detector. So imagine, I'm going to turn the page, so let's imagine that we have our label over here, and we... Here we have the label, and we have feature one, feature two, feature three, feature four. Which, well, having done a prior study, then we have been already told that they have an impact on this label. And um, what we have to do is create a features label. So this vector of character. Sorry, the vector of features is based on numerical figures for these features. Here we've got 0, 128. Normally we would be talking about, well, we're talking about double, uh, like decimals. We're talking about uh, decimal values. So we're talking about numerical values. And here we have the corresponding figure. And when we go to the algorithm, we're going to have a whole set of feature values, and we're going to know what the value um, is that we must obtain for those values. So the value of the label when we have these feature values. That's really the idea behind it. So what's the pipeline or the life cycle, as we could call it? So we have the uh, income of data, or the intake of data. Imagine you've got lots of uh, data lots of things that we're interested in and so when we have that data intake we have to have the features we have to extract the features after that we have to put them into the correct format appropriate format so like I said if we've got different text ones we have to turn them into numerical values and clean them up 
What does this mean if we clean them up? Well, we have to clean them because normally when we get the data intake, we will be getting some data in blank, some strange figures, and we, they have to be cleaned up. So once we have extracted the features, we've got the correct format, we've got rid of anything strange, then we come to the part that we call training. Training for machine learning. So in other words, in this step, we have created our features vector. Here we have it. And now we have to do the training for machine learning. So we have to choose a machine learning algorithm of all of the ones that exist. We have to choose one. Then, well, we can see later that we can try with different ones and adapt. But we have to choose a machine learning algorithm, and that algorithm will be applied to the features vector. But what values, you might ask me? Well, precisely the ones that we've got from the data intake. So before we have the training, normally what's done is that all of the uh, data we've received, we've cleaned up. These are the features values, basically. So that whole set of values is going to be divided into two groups and in group of training data and the test data group. So the data, I'm going to divide them into two groups. Normally the training group of all of the data, we're talking about 80% of everything and the test would be 20%. And so why you might say, are we going to use this data? Well, it's precisely for this machine learning part which we're coming to. So I would take the training data group and when it comes down to it, these are values for the features and for that, the value that we should get for the label. And we're going to start to train the algorithm. We're going to apply it to that set of values. Because if you want to see a comparison, for example, if you've ever been studying for an exam and what you've done is taken an exam from previous years with the solution, with the answers. It's a bit like that. So you take previous exams where you've already got the answer and you can look at how they answered them, how they solved the problems. And this is a kind of the same idea. That's the training process. And when we've trained the algorithm with this data, then it's going to generate a predictive model. And what does that predictive model do for me? Well, that model, what it allows us to do is to apply this model to another set of data for the features. And the model, what it's going to say is that for those all feature data, it's going to predict the value that the label should have, which is quite interesting. And that's what it's all about, basically. It's all about getting the best predictive model possible, because when it comes down to it, we want to have a, or train an algorithm so that it can know how to predict a particular event. So in order to generate this model, what the algorithm is going to do is look for patterns in this training group. It's going to look and it's going to say what pattern occurs in order to get a particular label value because it looks for patterns in these features. In order to get a particular value for the label, we have to have these certain conditions fulfilled. And that's how it comes up with a predictive model. And we can use that for predictions and apply it to new feature values for which I don't know the label value. The problem is that in order for this to become a pre an efficient predictive model, we have to carry out different training activities and checks. And here what comes into play is the second part of the data that we have here, the test group, to test whether that predictive model is effective and efficient. We have to use the second, the second group of data. Here we have feature values, and I also know the label value. So what we're going to do is apply this predictive model to these values. The predictive model will tell me that the label has to be so much. And that value that is predicted by for the label, I'm going to check it with the ones that I know that I should get. So if I compare the two, I can have a set of metrics and statistics that will allow me to know whether the predictive model is efficient or not, or whether we have overfitting. We've got this overfitting, which is when we create a predictive model, 
which is so precise that it only works with the training data. So in other words, what we have to do is to have a predictive model which is um, something which can be generalized, which can be used to provide a pattern and to be exported. It can't only work with our training data. And to this end, we use the test group of data so that we can see whether this algorithm can be applied in general terms. And that is the process of machine learning. And then we would have the last step, which is the production, the deployment. When we've found a good predictive model, we just deploy it and we use it, then we can use it use with uh, real life data, you know, production data. And this is really what we're going to do here. So in other words, what we would have to do, what we're going to do in the proof of concept, okay, is to create, first of all, we're going to look at where we get the data intake. The intake I'd like to show you that, but I have to restart because uh, basically, though, what we've done is to go to a website from the city of Chicago, which has open data published, and they are statistics regarding the crimes that have taken place since 2001, so since 2001 till now. And so, what we're going to do with the proof of concept? Well, in the proof of concept, according to the information provided by the city of Chicago, I'm going to try to do a machine learning algorithm which will predict when the drugs offences are going to be committed. And I'm going to export that. I could, we could extend that to any other kind of crime, uh, you know, robbery in homes, rape. It basically is all about just having the information you need. And one of the most important data for machine learning is this one. It's the extre extracting, sorry, the extracting the features. This was what makes it useful or not. They have to be really predictive features, and that's why we have to have important, efficient information. We have to really carry out a kind of professional uh, sen um, um, analysis or study, a criminological analysis in this case. And right now I'm working in a project to develop this kind of software in, in large scale. And this is already being, this kind of thing is already being uh, worked on in the United States and used. There are systems that are being used in LA and in Los Angeles and other places. And it's been seen that it does reduce crime. And in Spain, a few months ago, there was a public tender where they were asking for these kind of tools. And in Europe, it's being done as well. So they're having public tenders for these tools that are going to be used by the police because it's being seen that it does work. It really does work. I'm not telling you, or I'm not inventing it, you know. It's been seen to be useful. Yes, that's important, of course. The microphone. Ah, my, thank you. My question is whether uh, the sample is important. Well, yes, there are two things that are important in order for this application to be efficient. There are two things that are important. First of all, the one that I've written on the board, we have to extract the predictive features. If we don't have predictive features, then this is just rubbish. And we have to look at the causes and model them. And then the second element is what you mentioned. It is all you know, based on having as much information as possible because then we will be able to train and improve the algorithm as much as possible. If you train it with a lot of information, then the algorithm is going to develop better patterns, and that's what it's all about. So the more data we have, the better. In reality, in the proof of concept, what I've done is to take for the training. I've taken data from 2013 and tests for 2014. A question? Yes, well, maybe the question is technical. That's fine. It, when it comes to validation, well, let me just tell you, the data are divided into three groups. We have the training group, the validation group, and the test group. But here, to make things simpler, I just divided it into two. But well, just to, I work in basic investigation into machine learning. Uh, for example, does it support a stratified, stratified you talked about the validation and uh, when the MM lib, ML lib, I think it does, but if you work, work with 
Assure, you can have cross-validation, that's for sure. In Spark, I've not used cross-validation, but in Assure, Microsoft Assure, which is another platform for machine learning, which is uh, uh, perhaps more visual, more attractive. And Assure is more of a kind of palette. Here you have your tools, you have your entities and such like. In Assure, you have cross-validation. In MLLib, I'm not sure about that, but maybe in the latest versions, in the 125, I think, because it's measuring everything, since they're including uh, DR and everything. Okay. And another comment, just so people can understand the capacity of Spark. You've not talked any, or said anything about Kafka, which is a parallel high-performance system. I was something I was going to talk about at the end. Well, no, I just rather I would rather you talked about it. Well, at the end, I was going to show you an image, a JPG showing the architecture of the whole complete system, right from the intake to the collection of data, uh, the Kafka queue, and then sending it to a Flume agent, and then storing the information in HDFS, and then the predictive engine, taking it to Cassandra, and then putting it into um, uh, favorites. But it, when I use the screen, it, uh, it kind of gets blocked. I'll have to restart it now. but. That's what I like. I need people to participate. You know, that's what I want. That's great. Well, as I was saying then, let's get back to that. The important parts are extracting the features and to have as much data as possible, the more the better, in order to get a good algorithm. So in the proof of concept, what I have done is to take classification algorithms. What's classification? Well, this is a supervised learning algorithm. And what's that? Well, a supervised algorithm is what I've been talking about, which it, it means that it does predictions and it uses labeled example data. So I know the output that I should be getting. So I'm going to use algorithms for classification. And what they do, well, we have different types, classification, regression, and so on. What's the difference between those two, for example, when the type of variable that we want to use, if it's classification, then the variable would be a discrete variable. It can be one within a fin finite set of values. Uh, on, on the other hand, it could be identifying whether spam, when a, whether an email is spam or not spam. So it's two values. Or who's going to win the league? I've got a finite group of teams, and that's a multi-class classification. And if we talk about regression, on the other hand, regression is when the variable that we want to predict, when we want to predict predict it, it's a continuous variable. So, for example, like we talked about earlier, the price of the shares of a company. Or to calculate the weight of a person, you've got many more values. So, what we're going to use are classification algorithms and the proof of concept that we're going to execute as soon as it gets restarted. It's going to be based on three algorithms. Logistic regression, support vector machines, and decision algorithms, and I'm going to compare the three algorithms. So, well, I shall finish with the presentation and we'll go on to the proof of concept and then I'll let you get home. I'll let you escape. So here we have the three algorithms that we're going to be looking at. The first one we see up at the top is the logistic regression model. This is the shape. And even though regression, a logistic regression, may trick you because the name is actually a classification. Uh, and logistic regression, as you can see, it's got an S shape. It's the blue curve. It's the kind of S shape curve. And it's quite useful when, when we want to separate the object in one class from another. And as I said in our proof of concept, we're going to predict whether an example is, well, if we have certain conditions, are going to lead to a drugs offense or not. So the data will be positioned on the one side where we have the label with zero. The label would have the value of zero if there is no offense. And if it predicts that there's none and it takes um, value one, if it predicts that it will. And so that curve will allow us to separate one from the other. Do you want me to tell you a little bit more about logistic regression, or should we get to the practical side of things? Okay, the practical side. Okay, the second one we have the support vector machine, which has that graph, a line separating the dots from one and the other, but looking for the greatest margin 
possible. So, in other words, it's looking for a line that has the greatest margins. These are the dotted lines with the dots or between the dots uh, uh, from one group and the other group. And then we have the decision making trees, the decision tree. And even though you can't see it very well, I could try and make it bigger, but it's a decision tree for checking. Here it says, is it raining? And this tree checks whether I'm going to go out or stay at home. So it says, well, there is a whole series of nodes where the internal nodes represent a decision, a binary decision, so on the, we can go to one side or the other. And then we have the prediction. So if we say, is it raining? Then we've got, if it is raining, yes, then I'll stay at home. That's a decision. If it's not raining, then I would ask, is it cloudy? And if I say yes, then I stay at home. If it's not, then is the wind blowing? Yes, stay at home. No, go to the beach. So the circles are the decisions. So now we're going to see the practical application. I'm just going to have to restart very quickly. Okay, well, I'll just have to press the button because it's not even letting me uh, exit. No? Okay. Well, that's, didn't you do? That's perfect. So, great. Thanks. Before anything else, the first thing I'm going to show you here, here we have the data set. This is the data set for the city of Chicago. It's public data. Uh, regarding the crimes committed since 2001. So like I said, I've taken data from, well, for the training data, I've taken data from 2013 and for the test from 2014. So of all of these attributes that I've, or features that I've got here, and it's a little bit limited because in reality, we can't find the causes here. It doesn't talk about the real effective causes of the crime or the offense. So what the label we want is the primary type. So it's a type of crime. Here we can have theft, battery, criminal damage, motor vehicle theft. And our objective is to predict. Well, our program is, is to predict narcotics or drugs offenses but it could be done for any of these crimes. I just happened to choose narcotics, but I could have chosen any other. So this could be used uh, by any other state agencies or the DEA, for example. So we want to look at the features. And so in that case, I'm going to open up the code so you can see that. Here we have it. So I've taken these features, which are not the most predictive one, but they're the ones we have. I didn't have any others. And so the, you know, the base was a bit limited. And if we look at this in a more serious way, well, I can mention this at the end when I give you the final picture with the architecture, then I'll talk about how you'd have to do this. But the first one, the primary type, is the kind of crime or offense. And that will be the label. That's the label that we want to predict. Then I've taken date as a feature, if there's an arrest or if there's no arrest in the example, if the district in which it took place, the latitude also of the crime. So the five at the bottom refer to a specific crime. And that specific crime or offense uh, will be of one kind or another. And so what I've done is to create a class which is crime stack and what that does is to encapsulate that features vector. It kind of encapsulates it. And I'm going to come down the bottom to show you this. Here what we do exactly. Here what I'm highlighting is to load the data files from 2013 and 2014. As you can see, I call it prep crimes. That's the function which is at the top and it calls a text file like you saw in the example. And then what do we do? Well, what I do is take the information that I've got that and I'm going to choose or stick with the fields that I'm interested in. And all of these, I'm going to select the ones that I want for the data set. 
So I'm just sticking with the columns. I'm keeping the columns that I want in order to form my data set. And this is what I'm doing here. I've got column one, sorry, column two, five, eight, 11, 19, and 20, because that's what I'm going to use for the label and for the features vector. And the same, I would do the same thing for the 2014. And after that, we could call the gen features, and that's when I create the features vector. Gen features creates, creates the ve features vector, and then an Im another important part is this, which is the past data. So in order to get the features data, we have label point. A label point is formed by a label uh, the label, the, the number, and the features vector, and that is the structure. So if BALS 0 is, well, here I have, if I have found, I'm, I'm looking at the feature or the characteristic that corresponds to the label, then I would say if it's 0, 0 0.01, which is the value I give to it when it's in a narcotics offense, if you remember, I said there was a method to turn text into numbers. So here, I've assigned 0.01 to narcotics. So if I have the column of the type of crime and it's got the value 0.01, then it's got the label 1.0. And if not, it's 0.0. And then it will go to one side of the graph or the other. That's how I distinguish between the two. So that's the key. So the key is precisely that. It's all about discerning or distinguishing uh, between the two and assigning values or uh, um, figures to the text. And so I assign 1.0 or 0, 0.0. And then in the second part, what I'm calling is the feature vectors. There are two kinds of vectors. The dense ones is one of the kinds, and we know them as the entire vector. Uh, well, with this, uh, we're looking at, you know, going into all the detail here, but here we're talking about. Here we have the figures, and in the dense format, it's stored just like that. We have all of the entries. It will be the same. In the space format, which is a little more efficient, what it does is it stores only the ones which are not zero. So in the space, space format, you'd have three. Then you have the indexes of the elements which are not zero. Zero and one and two, so we've got zero and two positions, and then you put the elements which are not zero, so 1.0 and 3.0. So now you know what a dense vector is in a sparse, ve a sparse, sparse vector. And maybe the second one saves time when there aren't many elements which are a zero. So here we're talking about that. We've got the features vector, and this brings us to preparing the data. Start to prepare the training set and the validation set. And so what you have to know is that you have to normalize the data. What does this mean? Well, scale them. You have to scale them, which means that we have to all have them all in the same scale. So imagine you have some data with values in thousands, other values in tens, others in hundreds, so that the algorithm can be efficient. We have to have them all in the same scale. I don't know whether to go into this detail, but when we scale data, what we normally do is that we have all of the data in the same feature. They have an average of zero and a standard deviation of one. The deviation, the standard deviation quantifies how dispersed the data is. And so in order to do this, normally what we do is take the value of a feature, we take away the average and we divide it between the standard deviation. And in that way, we manage to get all of the values in the same scale. And after telling you all about that, uh, here we can see that on the screen it's done automatically, so it's almost like I want to punish you. So we've got the standard scaled, and we can see that, and then I can begin to train. And I do the same, but I prepare the validation test. Once I've scaled the training test data, I do the same with the validation test. And here I include some metrics that I'm not going to go into right now, and here we start and we start to execute it. 
and then the part of the training, if when we get to the training part, I'll stop and I'll show you, we'll get to this part. Here we are, and again, and again, and here. Vale, pues aquí mientras que esto se va ejecutando, vale, pues aquí eh, lo que estoy haciendo es ejecutar las instrucciones. ¿vale? Maxi Kitchen the instructions, the other ones of Scala Forest Park, and we have another one and then another one for uh, for our. And here is executing that whole part I was telling you about, and here I'm going to execute until the part where the algorithm rhythm trains. Here is preparing all the data, all the data, the feature vector. I scale all, all the data so that all the data are within the same scale. And I just stopped when I need to start training to the algorithm of the logistic regression, which is the one I mentioned that has a curving S. Surprise the dating as. Well, let me tell you about the size. But I don't know by heart. But I took data from 2013, and that's how far it got. And next, let's look at the real part of training the algorithm. Construir el modelo de regresión logística, que es esto de aquí. Build the logistic regression model. This part that goes until here, I'm going to execute until here. Okay. I'm just going to put this here and I'll show it to you. I'm executing this part here that is shadowed. So here I'm using the train method of the logistic regressions class. I'm transferring the iterations and I'm transferring the scale training data. I'm actually transferring all those labeled examples, they're all within the same scale, as I told you, for the algorithm to learn how to find a pattern. Now, according to this type of algorithm and this S curve, they can find the best S curve to separate and to split the examples. Whether it's a drug crime from the ones where there isn't a drugs crime. I'll just check whether this is finished. Okay, here it is. I'll show it to you next. So once I've trained it, I've done this part, and I also have the prediction part that uses this method called predict. After the train method obtains the predictive model, and here I have the pointer, and I get the 2014 data, and I contrast it, and I check whether that predictive model is useful. And I wanted to show you here that the first value is the prediction, and the second one is the label. I'm not really good at making things nice, but I issued some statistics, and with this model I obtain a precision of 0 0.36, a recall of 0 0.99, and a cure and an accuracy of 8.82. So when you go home, please look at the accuracy paradox, because the accuracy sometimes may be misleading. I'm not going to tell you about it, because there's a lot of information already, but these are the statistics that my algorithm obtains. And so you can see the results it obtained. I'm going to go back up right here. For example, can you see these value pairs? The one on the left is the prediction. On the right, we have the label prediction. On the right is the real value. So in the last case, the algorithm predicts that in fact there would be a narcotics crime, and he says that they really take place. That it does, that it doesn't. On the fifth one, from the bottom, there is a bad prediction. There is, it says there is a narcotics crime, but in fact, this doesn't happen. Regarding what? Regarding the values it got as an input. And here I'm going to add this and execute it. So you can see clearly that this is the exit, but I'm not showing the entry. So you can see the entry of the prediction. I'm going to execute it here, right here.
Perfect. Okay. So now I'll execute this. Ahí. Okay. Lo que he hecho, lo que voy a hacer ahora mismo es que salga también la entrada, ¿vale? Os voy a poner. Well, here we're going to show you the prediction and the exit that should be, and the output that should be obtained, and the, and I'll explain it. The first number is a prediction it makes. The last one says that the algorithm predicts that a narcotics crime will take place. The, the answer is that it, it really does take place. In the test data, we do prove that it is happening. But for which input values is this prediction taking place? All the ones that are between brackets. Those are the feature values. Our system will be receiving information from the outside. It will be monitoring different sources such as social media, the streets, security cameras, and depending on the features we have, they will fill in the values of the feature vectors we have between brackets, and for that in input, when we apply them to a real case, and when they get this kind of uh, input, or they follow that pattern, the algorithm will make a prediction. And eventually it's this. This is how it works. I'm not showing it graphic in a graphic or beautiful or visual way, but this is what it's about. Between brackets we have inputs from our sensors, from our data sources. Oh, please don't die on me. Don't die. Oh, here it is. And the 1.0, the 0.0, the 0.0 is a prediction. It's a predictive system, so we, here we compare different algorithms. Here we see the different statistics obtained with this model. And next we check which statistics are obtained with a different model. I'm going to show directly with the ones that get with the one that gets the best the statistics, which is the decision tree. Okay, so right now I'm training and testing on the same data, but using the decision tree algorithm to see how precise, in fact I'm going to execute these last instructions so that you can see it, and here we obtain an accuracy of 0.91%, which would be where we need to look at. So what we'll do in practice is after I have the features vector, we do the study and we do the cleaning and input of data or intake of data, we look at the most efficient met metrics that obtain the best patterns to predict certain examples. In this case, it will allow me to predict whenever there's a narcotics crime and whenever that doesn't happen. Here I've used three. We have logistics, support vector machines, and the one with best statistics is the last one for the decision trees. I have a 0.91% and it has a 91% of, effect, of effectiveness. And we're prediction algorithms, we string an algorithm for it to learn. And last, I'm going to show you the architecture of a real system. As you may see, I'm not really good at painting or creating nice charts, but a real system could be this one, where we have a bet a web interface, where we control the tool that is nice and friendly. And from here, we would have access, so we would launch a series of web strappers, kind of spiders, that are checking different information sources for crimes, and with ISIS and terrorist recruitment, it would be very interesting to monitor the social media, as well as the Darnet, Tor, Freenet, ISP, Fora, websites where people comment, Foro Coches, which is a Spanish forum. And eventually can get all the information. As a colleague was saying, we could go to a Kafka queue and from there we would go to a Flume agent that would clean the information and clean.
and beautify the information and then that HFS, HDFS system will give us information to create the features vector we're going to use and we will send that to the predictive vector or engine that will be using supervising and unsupervised logarithms and the predictions will be a non-SQL engine to allow large amounts of unstructured data and all the information stored in Cassandra would be shown in a friendly way in a web interface to do queries on that information and that's an example of an architecture that's being used right now, I cannot say where to start researching these kind of solutions at the European level so that the site security forces at the European level can use it and this is it really so you can know some key concepts. Thank you for being strong after this big war. But if you need to remember something about this presentation, remember that these tools are already being used. So let's be careful with our internet privacy. Let's tell everyone around us. Because regarding terrorism, for example, that excuse is being used to restrict the usage and the freedom that we have on the internet. And in fact, as you may see, these tools may be very invasive because depending on what we get sources right now, France, for example, a few days ago, is saying that they're closing some false flag attacks and they're closing those websites. So the less sensitive information about our, ourselves we share on the internet, the safer will be. And here we're trying to raise awareness so that you can remember that we need to take care of trojans and viruses, but also of sharing less inform personal information on the internet because that could lead to problems. And thank you very much for being here. After this big war, I need to endure your questions now. So if you want to shoot me, I do deserve it. Sí. Sí. Lo voy a pasar a la gente de la de la la presentación está en Prezi y el código. Le... The presentation is in Prezi and I'll give the code to the organization so they can upload that. I'm being asked whether the code and the algorithms would be available. Yes, everything would be available so you can play with it, modify it. But this is a concept, a proof of concept. It's very small. You can do your own modifications on the algorithms, but eventually we're just trying to try to work on this. I think there are some questions up there. Hola, sí, hola, ¿qué tal? Quería preguntarte. Entiendo que esto es muy sensible. I understand that this is very sensitive to changes. This model. Which one? Logistics regression. But since you're training it, for example, a pros crime of prostitution, if Gallardón closes the largest park in Madrid, you might not eliminate that problem because that crime might transfer as well. How do you eliminate it? Well, this is very sensitive, as you were saying, to changes. And for that, we need to define th some thresholds. I didn't talk about it because I didn't talk about logistic regressions and some decision factors, but to separate different examples and know the differences between some classes and others, what the algorithm does inside is calculating a number between 0 and 1. And from that number between 0 and 1, it uses a threshold that we may define as users to say whether the end number, let's say that he calculates a score of 0 0.6. If my threshold is 0 0.5, I may say that 0 0.6, that value calculated, will be labeled as a narcotics or prostitution crime. But if my threshold is at 0 0.8, it will tag it as not having any criminal activity. So this study of criminal experts and people who know what will create some crimes will set my threshold and whether it's higher up or further down or whether I need to fine-tune it above or below.
but you can actually play a little bit with the thresholds depending on the information given by the advisors you can play a little bit with that I think there's a question right there in the corner Well, I recently read about an Apache project called Flink. But, um, do you think it may replace the Spark, or do you think the Spark has a long life to live? Well, if you follow people on Twitter who talk about data science and big data, it's just news with every new incubator that Apache that Apache does. The one that is going to call Hadoop, or that other one, or that other one, it just continues. It's like a recurring sentence. Since they want to promote it, each new technology, for each new technology they say is going to kill the other one, or the former one. But this park is quite strong at the moment. It's very quick, but eventually there will be a new one to replace the former one. And as you said, these are recurrent phrase everywhere. You follow people who talk about this on Twitter, you know, each piece of news will kill the, the, former, the former one. Well, any other question? Yeah, she deserves it. Analysis on a Spark streaming. Yeah, regarding social media analysis for us at SNA, what would it be on this area? For example, in the crime prediction tool, this would be tax analysis. Depending on what you want to monitor there, here I have your Spark streaming and it will be on that side. So I got this from the web interface. On the one hand, the web interface would render some commands to launch them on our spiders for them to monitor websites and fora and the darknet. And then we would have a job Spark streaming for it to assess social media, Twitter, Facebook, and all that. Exactly. And eventually, the information I get from there is send it to HDFS that takes it to the predictive engine. Well, Thank you very much, everyone. And please go for a beer after this and forget everything.